All right, so we have the 1980 election. We talked about Jimmy Carter already, and in 1980, the Republicans nominate Ronald Reagan. Now, what are the main issues? The economy, of course, international respect, uh, the idea of malaise, and this crisis of confidence. Now, Ronald Reagan, who was he? He was a former Democrat. He had even voted for uh, Franklin Roosevelt four times. And he had stumped for Truman. In the 1950s, he recognized that many of the Democratic answers to problems were only making things worse. And in 64, he would give a dramatic speech supporting Barry Goldwater at the Republican convention. And this really put him on the national political map. He would become a two-term California governor. And he challenged Ford in 76. Uh, he may have earned the 1968 nomination uh, if he had not promised to finish out his term as California governor. A promise that he made to the electorate. He was charming, he was optimistic, he was religious, he was inspirational, he was an excellent public speaker, he read people well, and he was a storyteller with stage presence. In many ways, the opposite of Carter. Now, Reagan focused on states' rights, he focused on lowering taxes, he wanted to increase military spending, spending uh, dismantle a bloated bureaucracy, he argued that inflation and unemployment were government problems, not flaws in the American political uh system or in the people's character. <clears throat> he was an old-fashioned American. Uh, he favored initiative and ingenuity, and he believed that these would reestablish us as the commercial center of the world. And our strength and determination would make us the number one world power again. He was dubbed the great communicator. Now, while Carter was self-righteously criticizing Americans for not being frugal and simple enough, and moralized on all of our characteristics and denounced the evils of free market capitalism, Reagan presented an optimistic view and promised a, quote, revolution of ideas. These uh, would help restore national pride and, again, regain international strength and respect. A few of his quotes. Our optimism has once again been turned loose, and all of us recognize that those people who kept talking about the age of limits are really talking about their own limitations, not America's. A recession is when your neighbor loses his job. A depression is when you lose yours. A recovery is when Jimmy Carter loses his. <laughs> uh, one, of his uh, one of his main slogans in 80, are you better off than you were four years ago? Another one, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. And I will post uh, his Morning in America commercial, which was very powerful at the time and uh, quite convincing, I believe, to many people, too. Now, Carter railed against Reagan as dangerously conservative, implying that he would, quote, roll back civil rights legislation and risk nuclear war against the Soviet Union. What happened? Carter would carry six states. Reagan carried 44. Reagan snagged 489 electoral votes to Carter's 49. The popular vote, Reagan took 44 million, Carter 35 million. This was a landslide, a blowout of historical proportions. Now, the true story of the election was the focus on the economy. Carter had an approval rating of 23% and only exacerbated the problems associated with stagflation and the energy crisis. His constant moralizing and scolding of the American people only lowered their spirits, whereas Reagan provided a new sense of optimism, a renewed vision, uh, a renewed vision of American greatness. He called this morning in America. Now, Reagan had many levels of support. He had what was called the Moral Majority, which was established in 1979 by the Reverend Jerry Falwell. America had gone through a religious revival of sorts in the 1970s. People reacted to the excessive liberalism of the 1960s, the chaos. I have mentioned the search for order. Many sought through the church a way to explain and deal with the many issues facing the nation. Religion provided solace for many and a way to make sense of, again, this chaos around them. This was not limited to evangelical Christianity, but extended to Catholicism. Reagan's stance on abortion particularly attracted Catholics. Uh, they also had an express goal of an establishing a religious right wing, and in many ways they did. Religion was again included as important to conservatives, and this group in particular would make their voices heard in many issues throughout the decade. A second uh, major wave of support was the anti-feminist backlash. We spoke of Phyllis Schlafly, and she was the leader of this group who which fought against the ERA. By 1981, million abortions were being performed every year in the U.S. Many sought to curb this. An increasingly liberal Democratic Party helped to facilitate this rise of women who sought to remain uh, 
and hold their traditional values in society and hold their traditional roles in society. Many were professional women, but they felt modern feminism just went too far. A third major leg was business. The Business Roundtable was established in 1972 to promote interests of business in Congress. They formed PACs to distribute funds to pro-business candidates. Special interests were not simply for marginalized groups or industries. Um, again, business forms its own special interest in this way. And they established a they established various conservative think tanks, for example, the Heritage Foundation. This only helped them to figure out who would support them, but then how to garner that support. Now, part of the success of Reagan was psychological. Historians George Brown Tyndall and David Emery Shy have stated, quote, he helped Americans believe in themselves again, and that was worth a lot more than being a know-it-all president. Reagan was not a genius, nor was he sophisticated, but he was able to relate to individuals, and he was blessed with keen insight. He relied on his intuition and delegated a considerable amount of authority to his staffers. Now, this would come back to hurt him. We talked about how Roosevelt relied on his advisors and how he relied on those who worked for him. Reagan was very much the same way. Uh, and again, this will come back to hurt him, but we'll talk about that later. Reagan hired good people, and he gave them independence in their jobs. He reflect this reflected uh, he trusted them and he realized that he could not control every inner working of the government. In many ways, this reflected his p political ideology as he did not believe in a strong centralized authority, but a decentralized authority there, the state's rights and independence of the individual. Thus, while he was the undisputed leader in the U S during his two terms as president, he also relied on those around him to assist. This was part of his success, but again, it would also be part of the failures that he experienced. After decades of an emphasis on expertise, professionals, and academics, Reagan changed things, and this led to his connection with the common folk. Uh, one taxi driver commented, and this is, again, kind of a, a major quote that we uh, like to tie in with Reagan. A taxi driver stated, he's the only politician I can understand. And in many ways, that's what Reagan did. He connected with people directly and indirectly. And this was part of his support. This is one reason why he was so insanely popular. Now, Reagan succeeded in many ways that Carter did not. First, instead of trying to make a bunch of major changes at once, he focused on a few priorities. First, lowering tax rates, reducing the federal government, increasing military spending, and an aggressive anti-Soviet foreign policy. When asked about the Cold War, Reagan stated that he was not interested in containing communism. He was interested in defeating it. Quote, we win, they lose. It was that simple for Reagan. Reagan, unlike Carter, was adept at tactical compromise and legislative maneuvering with congressional leaders and foreign heads of state. He had a political acumen that was incomparable. He was able to negotiate with almost anyone and willing to compromise some things as long as his larger goals remained intact. Majority Leader of the House, Texas Democrat James Wright, said he stood in awe of Reagan and his political skill. Quote, I am not sure that I have seen its equal. Now, Reagan would state, if I can get 70 or 80 percent of what I'm trying to get, yes, I'll take that and then continue to try to get the rest in the future. Compromise was the key. This is the key to his natural his to our national political reality. For example, the Compromise of 1877. We talked about the Hegelian dialectic thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is what Reagan sought. Now, additionally, uh, I mentioned that he was solid uh, as far as finding this compromise, maneuvering with congressional leaders. Carter, remember, did not. Uh, did not succeed in this way. And part of the reason was because he brought a bunch of outsiders in. Now, that can be a positive. But if they don't know how to work the system and they don't know how to get along, again, Carter's administration was very insulated. This bothered many people in D.C. who felt that he didn't know what he was doing. And that only exacerbated these tensions. Now, <clears throat> Reagan got things done. Sorry. Reagan got things done. He did not just talk the talk. He walked the walk. Third, he was inspirational. Again, unlike Carter, who was constantly moralizing, constantly sermonizing the American people, telling them what they did wrong, Reagan was inspirational. He got people to believe in what he was saying. And again, he reached out to them in new ways. He did not blame them. He said, let's find a solution. His optimism reflected on mainstream Americans and revived faith in the American spirit. And this was essential. Regardless of ending the Cold War, his economic improvements, arguably the most important thing when we look at Reagan, and we'll talk about his assessment later, 
was the fact that he brought back optimism. He revived this faith in the American spirit. Now, Reagan comes, becomes president, and right away there's drama. March 30th, 1981, less than two months, or about two months after he is um, inaugurated, there is an attempted assassination on Reagan by John Hinckley Jr. Hinckley Jr. had a fascination with Jodie Foster, and he thought that if he could take out the president, he would finally impress her. He is found not guilty by reason of insanity. Undoubtedly, he's insane, but again, undoubtedly, he's the one who pulled the trigger. Um, if you watch a video of that, he shoots and he is tackled. Now, Reagan, again, is shot. He goes to the hospital, and as he's being prepped for surgery, this is classic Reagan, while he's being prepped for surgery, and uh, while waiting, he stated to the doctors, please tell me, you Republicans. <laughs> again, this goes along with his wit, his ability to connect with people. Um, one of those injured in the attempt was Press Secretary James Brady. His condition would lead to increased calls for gun control, ergo the Brady Bill. Now let's touch upon the economy real quick, and then we'll make a second video. Um, when he comes into office, Reagan faces annual inflation of 13%. Unemployment is at 7.5%. 7 7 Reaganomics, uh, or supply-side or trickle-down economics, voodoo economics, as George H.W. Bush would call it, um, is what he would employ. Reagan had believed for years that high income taxes were part of the problem because they weakened incentives for individuals to succeed. That if lowered income taxes, uh, that if he lowered income taxes, he could help to reignite the con economy through investment, saving, and spending. This way, affluent Americans could spend more money on consumer goods and investment. He also believed, um, <clears throat> sorry, kind of got lost there. He also believed that business faced too many government regulations and that massive social spending programs had hampered growth. Now, we see some similarities here to Keynesian economics. Again, the idea of being putting money in the pockets of people so that they can spend and invest. He had done this while in California. Property taxes in particular were extremely high. Reagan believed that if he could cut back the size and cost of government, this would enable reductions in property taxes. In 1978, a nonpartisan group the New York Times called a Boston, a modern Boston Tea Party, Party, mm -hmm, succeeded in getting Proposition 13 on the ballot. It was overwhelmingly approved. This would slash property taxes by 57% and amended the state constitution to, making, to make raising taxes more difficult. This would be copied in numerous other states. Now, by reducing taxes and easing government regulation of business, this would actually spur economic growth and produce more gov government revenues to help reduce the federal budget. So August 1st, 1981, we have the Economic Recovery Tax Act. This cut personal income tax by 25%. It lowered the maximum rate from 70 to 50%, and it provided other tax concessions. Part of this was a dismantling of great society programs, which Reagan believed had crippled the nation. He would reduce the rate of growth in these programs, if not cut back and transfer payments. Federal spending for all social programs in 1982 was actually $53 billion higher than it was in 1980. This was $35 billion less than what Carter wanted to spend. So liberal critics attacked him as reducing the amount of money for education and cultural program, programming, public housing, food stamps, etc. But in actuality, he, actually, he would raise how much was spent. So again, this flies in the face of this idea that Reagan just completely cut everything, left everybody on the uh, out of any kind of sorts, that nobody had any chances. Indeed, he actually raised this. And one of the issues that we would see uh, is that the federal deficit would grow under Reagan's time. Part of that is due to military spending. Part of it is because some of these, um, some of these programs he did not want to totally get rid of. Now, Reagan's focus was on helping the truly needy. He succeeded, and food stamp subsidies, for example, were only 4% lower than what Carter had wanted. Overall, though, federal spending went up and the federal deficit went up with it, but this was mainly due to Congress that approved budgets higher than what Reagan had requested. The economy would soar, but the deficit issue would remain and worsen after the Democrats took control of both houses in 86. Reagan wanted to balance the budget by getting rid of some of these massive social programs or at least scaling them back, but he had little success in convincing a Democrat Congress to do so. Thus, we enjoyed prosperity, but at the price of a high uh, budget deficit. Again, increased military spending would have something to do with this as well. We also see anti-unionism under Reagan. Um, for example, the 1981 air controller strike. Professional air traffic controllers organization participated in an illegal strike that's an illegal strike that sought to shut down all air travel. 
He simply fired them. The AFL-CIO lost political power during his tenure, and this in many ways reflected the will of the American people, and union membership declined. By 1987, re unions represented only 17% of the nation's full-time workforce, which was down from 24% in 1979. In the 1980s, a record num number of new jobs is, uh, are created. So again, reflecting many of the economic positives we see under Reagan. All right, we will come back and get to diplomacy and then the 84 election.